Um, welcome uh, to um, the last seminar, actually, of this year's series uh, titled Reframing Failure. I'm Mana Maria Sihani. I'm a postdoc research associate in digital humanities at um, the School of Advanced Studies. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of context uh, for this uh, seminar series, and also I'm going to introduce today's seminars and our speakers. So originally conceived um, as a series of conversations rather than a series of lectures, uh, reframing failure was a unique opportunity for us to reflect on practice. Um, throughout the year in six sessions, um, we welcome scholars uh, and practitioners within and outside the digital humanities, sharing their experience of on failing, uh, aiming to take an international and interdisciplinary approach to failure. Most of us recognize that failure is an unavoidable part of any scholarly endeavor, especially for people who work across discipline. Um, yet, for something so central to our experience, um, it often sits at the periphery of our writing, training, uh, and professional discourse and practice. So this seminar series uh, explored how we can reframe failure um, within the digital humanities, the ways we can learn from it, talk about it, and hopefully reconsider our collective relationship uh, to it. So we discussed about experimentation, um, sustainability of technical systems, um, about failed pr grant proposals and job ap applications, um, about complicated collaborations and partnership management, um, communicating and embedding uh, failure in our teaching and publishing agenda. Um, so, if failure forms an essential part of our scholarly practice, what comes after failure? And this is going to be the focus of today's last session. <clears throat> um, how can national organizations or communities of practice and carvers failing productively? Um, are there alternative approaches to research such as slow scholarship, for example, or failure as methodology uh, that can be integrated into our own research methods and uh, everyday life. Um, with this in mind, I'm just going to um, introduce our today's speaker. We are excited to have with us today uh, Lisa Goddard. Um, uh, Lisa is the Associate University Librarian for Advanced Research Services at the University of Victoria Libraries. Uh, she holds degrees from Queen's, McGill and Memorial University. Uh, Lisa's research interests include digital preservation, open access publishing, linked data, linked data and digital humanities. Lisa is the former chair of the Canadian Dataverse North Working Group, and she's currently a member of the Executive Management Committee for the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, and co-chairs the UVIC Research Data Management Strategy Committee. Um, Lisa is also a co-investigator on the uh, SSHRC funded Endix project. Um, this is going to uh, uh, hopefully introduce us uh, to these um, preserving digital projects for long-term uh, usability. And is also a team leader of the um, SPI funded uh, linked infrastructure for network cultural scholarship project. Um, David Stevenson is a Dean of Arts, Social Sciences and Management and Professor of Cultural Policy and Arts Management at uh, Queen's Margaret University, Edinburgh. Um, his research concentrates on questions of cultural participation, specifically focusing on relations of power and the production of value within the UK cultural sector. Um, his current research explores the absence of failure within the dominant narratives of publicly funded cultural participation projects and policies. David is also an associate director of the Center for Cultural Value and a member of the National Partnership for Culture, which helps him to inform and influence cultural policy decisions in Scotland. Um, Scott Wingard, um, he um, independently researches at the intersection of the history of science and digital humanities. He formerly directed programs at the University of Notre Dame and Cardinal uh, Mellon University, and held elected positions in the Association for Computers and Humanities and the Alliance, in the Alliance um, of Digital Humanities Organizations. Uh, his published work includes the uh, most recent, the networked, um, 
ton. The historian macroscope and dozens of articles spanning um, the science, social sciences, and humanities. Last but not least, um, Joris van Jurden um, is a senior researcher and developer in the humanities community. He holds a research position in the Department of Literary Studies at the Hawkins Institute of the History of the Netherlands, a research institute of the Netherlands uh, Royal Academy of Arts and Science. Um, his main research interest is in computational algorithms for the analysis of literary and historical uh, texts and the nature of and properties of humanities information and data modeling. Um, his current research focuses on the interaction between research software engineering and human interaction, uh, specific, specifically the tensions between hermeneutics and big data approaches. He also keeps himself occupied with computational approaches to stematology, narratology, and scholarly editions. And on that, um, I'm going to head to Michael for the first round of questions. Thank you. So as you can tell, we have a really diverse range of experience and expertise with us today. And I think I'm really excited to see what the conversation can bring out. Maybe the best place to start, ironically enough, might be thinking about endings. I know a lot of your research and work focuses on those things. Um, Lisa, in particular, the endings project, I think is a sort of obvious example of that. So maybe we can start with you talking a little bit about that experience um, and what you've learned about failure from studying the endings of projects. Sure, I'd be happy to give a little overview. I've put a link to the Endings Project website into the chat there if anybody wants to check that out later on. Um, so the Endings Project really was intended to investigate the way in which DH projects conclude. So um, we surveyed 127 DH projects back from the very early days of DH um, to try to find out where their challenges were, uh, what their plans were for conclusion, um, you know, what are the major reasons that DH projects don't, you know, uh, exist forever. Um, and one of the main takeaways, I think, from that survey is that most researchers who begin complex DH projects, um, especially those that produce online resources, tools, platforms, uh, really don't have a plan for how the project will finish. They, uh, about 60% of the responses that we got indicated that there is not now nor has ever been a planned end date for the project. That is to say, we're building this tool, this tool will be online and available forever, that's the plan. Um, or no end state for the pro project. So there was no sort of idea that at some point, instead of being like an active dynamic tool, this is gonna be a static thing that lives in an archive or something like that. Um, and so this is obviously a really big challenge in terms of having projects finish gracefully. If you have never planned for an ending and you kind of don't, ex you know, you're, you're sort of like not accepting that the ending is going to come, that ending is probably not going to be a very graceful ending when it does inevitably happen to you. Um, and so this is one of our main takeaways. You really need to think about the ending from the beginning. A project has to be designed to fail gracefully, and if it isn't, it will fail in a very messy and sometimes very public way. Um, because ending is okay, you know? I think that um, it's really problematic in an environment where funding is allocated in like a three to five year cycle, uh, and further funding is uncertain, but researchers are motivated to overpromise in order to make their submissions competitive. And so, you know, often the tool or the platform isn't even developed at the end of a five-year cycle. You still really just have something that's kind of beta. It's not fully production ready. It's not, hasn't been hardened very well. Um, and so, you know, this creates a situation where researchers run out of money just as their original infrastructure is aging out and usually needs to be upgraded. Five years is about that, about that time period usually. Um, their tool's still kind of beta. It's really not necessarily ready for prime time. And suddenly the money is gone. Um, and I think funding agencies are actually fairly well aware of this problem. Um, in Canada, anyway, a little, little has been done really to address mm. these issues. Both the researchers and the funding agencies continue to kind of play this game of maintaining a pretense that DH projects that are developed will continue to be available indefinitely despite the fact that it is really difficult to get funding or support for care and repair. 
So you have to have a brilliant idea, right? You have to have something new and shiny and innovative, and that's what funders are looking for. Just saying, I just want to continue to build my infrastructure and maintain and repair and upgrade it. It's hard to get funding for that. Certainly it is in Canada, and I can't speak for all countries, so I'm sure some of my fellow panelists will uh, will mention some of these things too. Um, so really, everybody has to sort of accept that a project's going to end. Design that project from the beginning as though it's going to end. Um, and I think that one of the key concepts there is to think about your data separately from your tool. Your data is actually the thing that will probably last, you know, more is able to last more indefinitely than your, the piece of software or the software environment in which it lives. So they should be designed quite separately from the beginning with the idea that the data is what will live on, not necessarily the tool that you're building. Um, and I think that that model will allow researchers to take advantage of some of the existing capabilities of libraries and archives to maintain data. So I'll talk a bit more, more about that later, but uh, I think that's that's probably a good start. I think that's an excellent start. And I think pointing to some of the ways that funding agencies kind of set the terms under which we operate will, I think, be a pretty significant part of this conversation. Um, so next, I want to head over to Scott to sort of pick up on that and to think a little bit about how we can maybe plan our projects to recognize failure as part of them and how that might sort of inform how that failure impacts the ultimate results of that project. Sure, thank you. And uh, uh, thanks as well for convening this. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's, it's a privilege to be in the room with you and, and everybody else here. Um, so the first step to uh, thinking differently about endings is to think about them at all, as Lisa was just telling us. Um, uh, I have worked on a similar project, uh, though not quite so far along on as, uh, as hers. So there will be some overlap uh, over what she said so eloquently and what I'm going to attempt to say, although perhaps with less elegance. Um, so when left to our own devices, uh, uh, as Lisa was just saying, projects don't die. Um, we just put them down temporarily. Uh, most of us have half a dozen projects that are just kind of zombies waiting to rise again as soon as we have some extra time. Um, and it was easier, not easy, but easier to stop projects when we mostly worked one book at a time. You write a book, you send it to the publisher, maybe do a tour, and that's it. You're on to the next thing. The publisher deals with getting the book out there, libraries and archives deal with access and preservation, and you can kind of wipe your hands of it. Uh, if you win the lottery and retire on some tropical island without cell service or Wi-Fi, your book will live on and there is no care and feeding involved. Um, in one of my recent projects uh, called Digits uh, with Matt Laven, Jessica Otis, and Matt Burton, uh, we interviewed uh, over 100 people working on various stages of digital projects and unsurprisingly um, found that they don't work the same at all. Um, and I will share a link after uh, I finish speaking. Um, not only do projects never end, uh, there is intense friction around every handoff point. Uh, so project teams uh, who make a digital object, if it doesn't fit into a PDF, uh, can spend years looking for a publisher or archive or even just a host to take it off their hands. Um, and then they usually fail at finding a long-term home. Uh, not always, but often. Uh, even when a team does successfully do that handoff, let's say to a publisher, that publisher will then need to go and find a long-term archival home. Um, and I guarantee you that the owner of the second home of a digital project won't try as nearly as hard as its creator to find its third home. Um, so it winds up happening because we rarely plan for a project's end in advance is the project ends at whichever of these three come first. Either the director dies, the website breaks, or the eventual heat death of the universe, right? Um, and these, I think, all constitute unproductive failures, uh, which is not what most of us are aiming for. Um, so the question about solutions, um, which is thinking about endings at all, planning them in advance. Um, one of my collaborators, uh, Elisa Bashara Bondar, sometimes calls on us to plan Viking funerals for our collaborative projects, which is, uh, I, I like uh, the, uh, the ritual uh, feeling of that. Um, and that's at the very beginning, uh, when your team comes together, again, as Lisa was saying, clearly there, there's a lot of uh, overlap and hopefully agreement uh, means that we're going in the right direction. Um, at, at the beginning, when your team comes together, if you're working on a collaborative projects, project, you put together a project charter. It includes how co-authorship is determined, what the end goals are, um, and importantly, it includes this end plan, 
uh, which is either a date, a finished project, or something that collectively signals uh, to the group uh, and to the public that this is the end, this ritual. Um, as well, um, uh, setting that plan for what to do with it when the time comes. And that plan might be shutting the website down uh, or flattening it uh, and making it easier to preserve. Uh, it might be publishing a book. It might be some prearranged agreement with a long-term home, something. Um, Matt Lincoln and I uh, put together a sample set of project charter templates, which I will also share after I'm done answering this question, um, that was uh, based heavily off of the excellent work that uh, the group at the Princeton Digital Humanities uh, DH Center um, have, have been doing for quite some time. Uh, one thing that I like to build into these charters, um, bringing us back to the idea of failure, are escape hatches. Um, that is figuring out what potential failure states are and then building in regular moments of reflection every few months to see if you've reached them. Um, and these can keep you uh, from diving too far down dead end rabbit holes. Uh, one metaphor I like uh, from the software development world um, is the concept of successive minimum viable products, um, uh, which uh, Yoris and my mutual uh, uh, colleague, Matt Burton, uh, taught me many years ago. Um, and it's the idea that if you set out uh, to design the first car, for example, you don't first design the axles, then the chassis, then the car itself. Instead, what you do is you set regular milestones, first a skateboard, then a scooter, then a bike, then a motorcycle, and finally a car. And if at any point you have to stop the project early, you still have a functional vehicle that you could use. Um, so bringing that metaphor into scholarly work, we might plan several preliminary reports or technical apparatuses that might eventually combine to constitute a final goal. But if at some point the project fails, you get to leave with something, even if it's just a report of what didn't work. Um, and that will help uh, uh, whoever is doing the project do better next time. And also it can serve as a, as a learning opportunity for others. Um, there was a, a poster that one of the early memes that went around uh, in, in the early web, early 2000s, I suppose, uh, maybe late 90s, which was a, a picture of a, a half sunken ship that says, said, maybe the, the uh, purpose of our life is just to serve as a warning for others. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's we, we got to leave those ships there, right? Um, and uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about the, the risks of being that ship. Um, uh, or of setting that chip down. Um, but at least for, for our purposes, having something like there um, that, uh, you know, there, there are many great models um, in, uh, in the digital humanities of this. Um, I think the most famous one and one of your uh, earlier interlocutors, uh, Quinn Dabrowski, has that autopsy on uh, Project Bamboo. Having these sorts of artifacts out there for others to look at um, is incredibly important for, for learning from these failures. Um, so a bit of a long-winded answer, but but hopefully a useful one. Yeah, definitely. I think it gives us a lot of places to pick up. Um, that idea of artifacts being useful for others might be a good place to, to go next, because I think that's one of the things that David's work touches on quite a lot. Um, and David, I think we're really excited to bring the cultural perspective that you offer, knowing that the cultural sector has some similar challenges to digital work, but that there's often some differences as well, and hopefully we can highlight some of those. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the fail space project that you've worked on, and particularly thinking about, you know, how we can talk about both failures alongside the successes and the projects that we deliver. Um, yeah, happy to. I've, <clears throat> I've put a link to, um, interestingly talking about websites, our piece of research had its own dedicated website and we planned to collapse it on somebody else's website at the end as an archive of the um of the products that was put into our funding bid and uh you know and again we had a conference to to end the event what's interesting in that regard is that other people won't let it end so despite the fact we made a very good attempt to try and end it um i keep getting kind of called back or, or re-invited back to engage with something that as far as i'm concerned is has finished so there's there's challenges there and actually people accepting that something's finished. Um, but I think the, the the project that we did very specifically looked at the cultural sector, not dissimilar to the, the higher education sector in that, um, particularly in the UK, it works on a model of public subsidy. That public subsidy is in a lot of cases project driven. 
Um, and so there are a lot of projects funded to, to varying lengths of time that have promised to do varying things. Our work was particularly concerned with equality, equity, diversity, and the amount of projects that are funded to do this. And the fact that after 30 years, nothing's been achieved. Um, we still have exactly the same problems. The sector still is undiverse. The money still goes to the same people. Um, and why then are there no evaluations that say this is failing? Um, so that was where the work started. And, and we, we've done various things that you can explore on the website. I mean, what came out of it that, that is pertinent here and I guess the things that people are interested in, first of all, was a real um, tension or pressure that people had whereby they conflated success with being valuable. The, the art sector in the UK, and it's not dissimilar elsewhere, is feels under a constant pressure to justify its value. Its value to the, the society, its value for public subsidy. It's constantly engaged in this battle of making the case. Um, and somewhere along the way, it has been internalized in the discourse that it is only valuable if it is successful. Um, and it's only valuable if it's able to show what it has done, what it has impacted on and what it has affected. Um, and I use a really crass metaphor whenever I'm talking about this to go, if I'm invited to a, a dinner on a Sunday and I arrive and there's this incredible roast pig in the center of the table, um, for me, that's a failure. I'm a vegetarian, so I'm not going to be eating that particular Sunday. But it's valuable. It's valuable to the other people that are there. It was valuable to the economy because somebody raised the pig and then killed it. It's nutritionally valuable. But it's a failure contextually because of what I wanted to get out of something. And that, that was where we got to the fact that at the beginning of projects, and, and I think SWATs to some extent and, and kind of um, having very specific objectives cause part of this problem is that people don't define what failure looks like at the outset for different people in different areas of work. Um, we are very good at defining kind of smart objectives um, and saying, you know, this is what we're targeting. And smart objectives are there to say, you know, they, they help in a particular way. And so what our project did was we adapted various frameworks. And a lot of our workshops now are with people at the beginning of projects, asking them to define what different gradients of failure in different facets of a work look like. So we identified five different facets of work for cultural projects. Um, and so those include things like the process, the, the product, the participation, the profile, um, and the purpose. And then across them, different gradients from outright failure to outright success. And at the beginning of projects, we make people fill in what would each of these look like? What would an outright failure look like for your audiences in terms of the process, in terms of participation? What would a tolerable failure look like? Um, and people find this quite interesting because they've A, never spoken about it, and B, they often find in groups or teams of people that they have a different idea of what failure would look like for them. And it often is very different from their participants. Um, and this can be quite helpful. Um, it's helpful because it gives a sense of what failure would look like at different levels. But what it also helps with is when it comes to evaluation, part of the big problem we found is that fundamentally the people who evaluate funded work are the people who have the most to gain by saying it was a success. Um, the, the people for whom this work is meant to have impacted are shut out at that point. And so everybody reframes anything as a success. And that's fundamentally because every project has successes in it. And you can just talk about them. That's not illegitimate. That's, that's you know, there's not a problem in that. But the selective editing of reframing something as a success without acknowledging that you said, look, if, if everybody comes to my event and nobody actually, you know, picks up this work, that would be a failure. I would take my own project as an example. It is a failure in terms of impact. We have not managed to change any practice yet in the sector, despite the fact that it is the most popular thing that I've ever written, that constantly I get to come and you know, be asked about. It's been brilliant from my profile, but it is a failure in terms of what I said it would do for impact. Those two things coexist. Um, and it doesn't mean that it may not be a success for impact in future, but at this point it is a failure. And we reported that back to our funders to say, we have failed to make any impact with this work, but it's done me very well um, out of my own professional profile. But we were only able to do that because at the beginning we used our own grid to show for us what failure would look like. And so we've not been able to run away from it. We had to go back and look at it and match it up with the description. 
I mean, I think that's that's such a wonderfully sort of meta way of approaching your own project, but to think about sort of your work as failure being an ultimate success. Um, and I really like that idea of sort of there being different gradients of failure for different people that your you know, audience might have a different sense of failure than the people actually producing the work. Um, and I think that's something that yours, you've actually touched on in some of your work looking at um, digital scholarly editions where you've worked on things where certain um, stakeholders in those projects are really pushing for a particular version of success, but that your users or your audience are, um, have a very different idea of what success looks like. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about that for us? Uh, yes, yes. First of all, thank you for having me. A very uh, interesting panel uh, so far. And uh, I can I can underscore about everything uh, my colleagues uh, just said. And uh, sadly, I think I, I have a perfect example that will show everything that can possibly go wrong with a, uh, a large scale project uh, uh, in the way uh, my colleagues just uh, just pointed out. Uh, so first of all, uh, I also have to say that, of course, every project at the Huygens Institute is a spectacular success from every point and angle of view you can possibly imagine. Uh, but aside from that, we have a tiny project. Uh, it was called Elaborate, and it, it goes back uh, at least to 2001. Uh, at the time, um, the Huygens Institute was, was not a, a digital or computational institute. Uh, in whatever uh, definition you you would want to uh, use, uh, the scholars in the, at the Huygens Institute at the time were uh, scholarly editors that would turn uh, historical documents and historical texts into uh, modern editions that would be published on paper as monographs or series or journals. Um, that is a model that is simply not economically viable anymore given the small audiences of these editions uh, and the very large costs involved in putting out the paper. Uh, so uh, we started the project, we were asked to start a project to build a digital platform uh, that would cater to creating these editions in a scholarly uh, responsible way and that would sort of use the digital technology to automate or at least support in a efficient fashion uh, the creation or part of the creation processes of digital editions. And uh, so far, um, I have to admit we have spectacularly failed. Um, why? Uh, well, one of the things that David said, and which is very interesting and, and in my experience, experience very true, is that a project has different audiences and the success of a project is defined for those different audiences in different terms. So uh, from a management perspective, uh, Elaborate, the, the, the name of the platform, uh, was to uh, simply, nothing is really simple, of course, but to make stuff more efficient, to, uh, to allow a platform or to create a tool that would allow editors to push out more historical uh, editions at a lower uh, cost of uh, production. Um, and that's, of course, when you, uh, when you try that, that's when you learn the hard lesson that actually in the digital world, things tend to be even more expensive, actually, uh, than in the physical world. Uh, so uh, if you start putting out digital editions, you get maintenance, you get sustainability issues, uh, you get upgrades, you get hardware, uh, you get developers, for instance, uh, which is simply extra personal costs. So uh, digital editions turn out just not to be cheaper in any way than physical print editions. Uh, that first of all. So from a managerial perspective, there was actually no business case for Elaborate. Uh, but because every project needs to be a success, of course, you know, if it works halfway, if it gets you, gets you halfway down the road, uh, let's invest some more, uh, rename the project and sort of start over or uh, have a, have a uh, what do you call that, a, a touch and go uh, uh, kind of uh, follow up to the project, which is uh, what happened now three times over. Um, no matter that, that I, as one of the uh, one of the uh, 
uh, manager or project leaders of the very first uh, version of this platform uh, started protesting actually uh, in, in not in a too loud voice, I would say, but at least, uh, you know, uh, throttling back a little bit uh, the gas handle uh, in the hands of the management with all these expectations that, in my view, weren't happening, weren't realizing themselves. Um, but somehow it's so important for management uh, uh, to be able to um, uh, uh, account the investment that they did, that the only way to account for that is to invest some more. Um, now, this this sounds like a horrible uh, car crash, train crash, uh, crash. Uh, it, it, in ways it is. Uh, but I have to admit that in uh, uh, Revolution 3, uh, of this project, uh, lessons start to be learned. So it's not a failure completely because uh, meanwhile, uh, um, code developers, programmers, engineers, uh, front end designers uh, and textual scholars alike are starting to learn the lessons uh, that influence influences their methodology. So slowly textual scholars are indeed getting uh, to become digital textual scholars, I would say. Um, so not all is lost, but uh, the investment is huge, and I'm not sure that it outweighs the initial goals of the project. Uh, a thing that I would like to add to that is that uh, if you look towards us as scholars slash developers that were uh, interested in creating this platform and or also uh, interested in the methodology that the platform uh, uh, puts forward or, or tries to further. Um, in that sense, it's also a failure, but almost a failure that nobody sees. Um, the very simple thought about Elaborate was why do we bother uh, textual scholars with XML angle brackets? I don't I don't know how many textual scholars are in the audience, but basically the uh, the default uh, de facto standard and process of creating digital editions is by handcrafting TEI XML supported by a thing an editor like uh, uh, Oxygen that will deal with a part of the angle brackets and the XML, but basically digital editing is still writing XML by hand, which is possibly not a bad thing, but it tends to uh, sort of defocus the content of the textual, uh, um, of the uh, historical text and focus very much on the technology that you're using. So you're thinking XML rather than thinking text. And we as scholars slash designers uh, had some trouble with that. We were interested, is it possible to create a interface or a platform that allows you to focus really on the textual content and the textual structure without having all these angle brackets getting in your way. Um, but that methodology, methodology part of, uh, of the project uh, completely failed to come across to the users of the platform. They were simply seeing this as a means of getting away from angle brackets and not as a means of thinking differently about models of text, which was our intention. Uh, we were, uh, to them, we were simply hiding the angle break and brackets and that was it. Um, and for the users uh, that have been using uh, Elaborate, um, it might not look like a failure actually, because we have a, a quite a few number of uh, scholarly groups that are, have been happily using uh, Elaborate to put out some digital uh, editions, uh, except uh, that, you know, the time, energy, uh, technology, and uh, uh, funding investment that was needed to put out those uh, editions uh, is, well, probably in the order of 200 or 300 percent of what it would have taken to just let them write their edition using something like MS Word. Um, so yes, and I, I I think if you if you listen to this story of a platform that meanwhile goes to uh, its uh, third uh, installment of trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, I think it underlines uh, many of the observations and the conclusions that my colleagues just presented to you. Um, so let that be a word of warning, I guess. Uh, and I wonder what uh, my colleagues 
uh, say of that? I think it's it's helpful to have sort of a concrete example to, to anchor our conversations today. And it's definitely interesting to think about how the contexts we're working in shape not just sort of our individual work, but the more systemic, you know, approach to something like management's approach to a particular project. Um, I'll pass it now back to Anne Maria for our next set of questions. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks um, to all the great um um you know points so far i think that it's like it helped us kind of uh sketch very nicely like um bigger picture of you know how different people different uh communities uh you know different uh <clears throat> um perhaps <clears throat> different communities of practice as well, um, conceptualize uh, failure. And on that note, I would like very much to hear, you know, how different people uh, think about, you know, um, the specific element of how how do different sectors, um, institutions have been, we, we, we are a great example of this kind of variety, I think, of perspectives, uh, even industries um, and communities um, think about the place, but actually also the usefulness of failure. Um, and I'd like very much to hear, you know, um, you know, what Scott uh, thinks about, you know, from your experience on various D8 centers and communities of practice, um, associations as well, so different um, groups of people and contexts. Sure, you were, you were asking me, right? Just double check. Great. Um, I think it's useful to break out tolerance for and utility of failure by um, career stage and institutional scale. So um, that is either how far as we as individuals are in our career stages or the place of an institution in a resource or reporting hierarchy. Um, individually, uh, we ought to uh, and not all of us do, have less tolerance for uh, failure than institutions. Um, it is our careers after all. Um, now, different people can afford different levels of risks. Um, uh, there's a host of factors, uh, socioeconomic, racial, gender, sexuality, and so on. Um, uh, unfortunately, privilege certain individuals to more opportunities than, to fail than others. Um, and that is a bit of a given, and I am not the right person to speak to it. Um, that said, if you are going the traditional academic route, uh, there's also career stages that are more or less likely to insulate you from or encourage different types of risk taking, right? If you're an uh, early graduate student, um, uh, you are supposed to be going out and exploring and failing and learning. Uh, if you're later in your uh, PhD, as long as you're not, you know, publishing things in the sort of open world, uh, your institution can at least to some extent insulate you. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's, I think it's a little bit, it looks like sort of a normal distribution curve of when failure is uh, riskier than other times, right? If you're at a tenure granting institution, once you have tenure, it's a little bit safer. Um, but I, I, I do want to speak to the question um, that you were asking about more sort of uh, focusing on institutional contexts um, and uh, so focusing now on a local context like um, uh, a center. Um, I've run a few uh, digital humanities centers uh, and these hubs usually have a handful of people at the most, um, maybe a large art orbit of students or fellows or something. Um, and they often rely on um, grants or other types of soft funding to stay afl afloat. Um, and because this uh, level is so close to an individual, um, I think you have sort of similar risk tolerances to individual where, where every failure has a real potential for reputational or other negative impacts, uh, loss of time, funding, personnel, whatever. Um, but there's also that risk reward balance. Um, so. In the digits project I was mentioning earlier, uh, for example, we learned that uh, oftentimes the most unusual digital projects uh, were often the most successful and impactful, um, also the most impossible to maintain. 
um, unusual projects are riskier in a number of different directions, and you don't know if it's going to be a hit or a disaster. But the things that do wind up becoming hits, um, they often are the ones that look different from what came before them. Um, so the balance that I liked to strike uh, when I was running um, centers at um, Notre Dame and at Carnegie Mellon, uh, I tried to, to have like a, a good 50-50 balance. So half the projects were uh, pretty unusual. Uh, a select few of them did pretty well. Many of them um, uh, went on the learning heap uh, and we continued on to something else. Um, and then the other half of the projects were things that were um, produced, that produced your standard article or an Omeka site or whatever it was. It had a very sort of set ending what what an ending looked like and then we would go on to the next thing um, but even 50 50 is a pretty high risk portfolio for most centers or individuals and i think it would have been too risky if we didn't use those project charters with clear escape patches um, that i was talking about earlier these little moments to sound the alarm and say hey this isn't working out let's stop and go the next do the next thing uh, rather than um, sort of putting good money after bad um, as they say. Um, and with the right institutional memory, each of these failures does lead to some growth. Uh, th th these are the things Yoris was pointing out earlier. Uh, we learn what technologies to avoid. We learn social factors to keep in mind for future projects, right? Like one of the things that we learned early on was that um, uh, uh, talking about what constitutes co-authorship versus um, uh, just uh, acknowledgement credit uh, was a was a, a huge uh, could could have led to like huge um, uh, social frictions uh, that we could have short circuited by talking about them earlier, and so we sort of built that into our project development cycle. Um, now, as you expand from there outside of centers to departments, to colleges, to universities, to scholarly organizations, disciplines, funding bodies, and so on. Um, the risk reward balance changes pretty drastically, as does what sort of failure um, feels beneficial. Uh, so, for example, for disciplines, the failure tolerance, um, well, for disciplines, the failure tolerance can also change over time. Uh, so, for example, from about 2005 to 2015 or so, uh, in the digital humanities, there was a, a, an oft spoken of ethos of failure in public um, for collective learning. Um, this was this was a pretty widespread feeling. Um, as the discipline has grown into a more formal scholarly community, I've seen much less patience for mistakes, especially for lessons we've already uh, we're already meant to have learned from from past mistakes. Um, I'm personally not thrilled with this particular development, um, as a lot of the I think major points for growth in our community have come out of recognitions of failures, whether they be methodological failures, failures of equity, whatever they happen to be, um, they they led to uh, sort of where we are today. And I, I think that it's um, to our detriment um, that, that I don't see that same ethos now that I saw before. Um, it also makes it harder for um, graduate students or other newcomers to the field um, to, um, to, to come in the same sort of way. Um, now, if we're looking at sort of another um, sort of institutional angle, uh, funding agencies, um, they still have other risks of failure. Um, I do want to caveat, uh, some of you know that I now work for a large funding agency that I will not name. Um, any views that I express here are solely personal, personal and do not reflect the organization. I am, I am uh, almost contractually bound to say that, and I apologize. Um, but speaking to that funder's perspective, um, at least a partially risky portfolio is pretty important in advancing the field, right? Finding what's going to come next. Uh, if what I said earlier is true, that more unusual initiatives tend to have an outsized chance of being important or impactful to a community, then funders need to lean to that, uh, lean into the experimentation. Uh, and that can be great for the growth of that scholarly community. Um, but if we flip the perspective back to individuals, especially uh, individuals from less privileged positions, that risk that's so healthy for a funder or a scholarly community might put a person doing the project um, in more immediate danger from whatever failure comes about. Um, uh, and then the risk of 
uh, funding risky work itself, as uh, Lisa was bringing up earlier, um, it, I believe Lisa was talking about this, is making less uh, money available for maintenance of important projects, right? If we're funding risky things and we're only funding innovation, um, then what happens to um, uh, all of the, the important maintenance work? Now, I know um, from, from personal and other experience that a lot of funders are, are really trying hard to figure out the right model for this sort of work, but I also know that there's, there's a long way to go, um, and I don't know what the solution to that is. Um, uh, but um, it's important that we actively consider how failures are so different for different groups. David was talking about this earlier, um, this uncomfortable friction of fail what failure is to one person versus failure to somebody else. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's a, it's a question that I think a lot of us are still grappling with and one, perhaps if there's interest in the, in the, um, uh, uh, with among the participants, we can we can discuss uh, during the Q and A. Fantastic, Scott. Uh, yeah, so interesting to hear from your perspective. Um, um, I would like also to hear, you know, what Lisa uh, thinks in terms of like the differences in the, you know, the place and the usefulness of failure, perhaps from a library's perspective, or also kind of. Um, organizations or, um, you know, this kind of institutional uh, context um, in Canada or as well? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. And um, I think that libraries and archives do have some tolerance for risk and for making mistakes in terms of the services and programming that we offer around our collections. But I would say that uh, typically we are inherently risk averse institutions when it comes to the things that we are called upon to steward. So uh, we might be willing to try a few new programs and maybe they don't work out and we learn something and we move on. But when it comes to collecting things, especially things that are rare or unique cultural artifacts, we don't have a lot of tolerance for losing those things, which means that we tend to take things in the first place that we think can easily be preserved. And this is where we often um, have tension with DH researchers because DH researchers rightfully look to libraries and archives and say, you are the organizations that uh, curate and, and steward scholarly outputs. You always have been. Now we're in a digital environment. That means you need to be able to do that digitally. And of course we agree. Um, but I think that there really are, are two different kinds um, you know, of, of digital outputs. And uh, it's pretty common for researchers to come to the library at the end of their project when all the money is spent in hopes that the library will adopt their project. So usually they're showing up with a pretty complex stack, like it's built on Drupal or WordPress or Omeka, um, maybe not the version we have running in the library. It might be software we don't have running in the library at all. We don't have any expertise in this area. Um, and really, you know, projects that have custom features, locally developed code, they're not necessarily well documented, the rights aren't always very well documented. Um, really, there are very few libraries and archives who are going to take on a project like that, because it doesn't scale at all. Every campus has hundreds of projects that look like that, and every one of those projects, and because you're all researchers, you know, those projects take quite a bit of care and feeding in order to keep them uh, keep them going over time. So it simply doesn't doesn't scale for us to say, yeah, we're going to take your whole software stack and we'll just keep that going forever. And I think that very few people who've talked to libraries and archives will have had the experience that they're willing to do that. It just is not feasible for us to do that at all. And taking things that we know we can't maintain is really outside of our ethos, you know. Um, <clears throat> we also occasionally have this discussion like, well, can you just dump my files somewhere? Like, can you just put my files into some kind of dark storage so they exist? Um, this is problematic for libraries too, because you know, the whole point of us stewarding these collections is so people can use them and putting thousands of kind of not very well named files into dark storage is almost a guarantee that that stuff will never be used again. And also now we've committed to maintaining it forever. 
um, not a great use of our resources and really often something that we're not willing to do either. If you want to put it on a storage network somewhere, then you can do that. But um, I think that people are kind of optimistic that that type of thing will be reused. And we know that it almost never will be because people don't even know it's there, you know. Um, that was one of the main questions of the ending pro endings project. We had programmers and DH researchers and librarians working together to say, what kind of project output is realistic for libraries and archives to be able to maintain? Like, what does my project have to look like at the end if I want help from my, you know, cultural memory institution? And uh, we've developed a set of principles. I'm going to pop the link into the chat on that. But, you know, the, the basic thing is that libraries can most easily steward static outputs. So if you have a website with a backend database and a bunch of tools for mapping or whatever, um, it's really the data. If we could take the data out of that project, we can probably put that into a repository somewhere uh, so it can be discoverable and reused. Um, or it's that we'll web harvest your project. So we'll make a kind of a flat version of that project. But your databases and those kinds of things typically are not things that we're going to take on and steward. So we're looking for projects that can be made static at the end. And so a lot of the endings projects that you'll see on the website are digital editions, and they are built really in, or, in a way that allows them to be totally independent. They don't rely on any server side infrastructure at all. They're just using some basic browser functionality, including um, a, a really cool uh, search um, interface that's built that's all sort of browser side. So uh, you don't even need server infrastructure to be able to deal uh, with search in these interfaces. So that's sort of where we, we end up going is saying the project should be designed so you can um, output a static product at the end. And that static product is what will be maintained, not not the actual working interface. Um, one thing that UVic Libraries has done in order to encourage researchers to come and talk to us, what like while they're putting in their funding application, um, is that we've created this thing that we call the grants menu. And it's just a list of the different services that the libraries can offer to grant funded projects with a list of sort of in-kind values for those services. So when you're looking for in-kind, you know, letters of support and those sorts of things for your project, you can come and have a look at what the library can do. Really, it's a way for us to have conversations about long-term sustainability with researchers as they are thinking about their project from the beginning, because that's really when that conversation, if you haven't built it uh, to be able to sort of separate out your data or to easily be made static, you're going to have a really, really hard time finding anyone who will maintain a project in the long run. So um, that's that's one of the major outcomes of endings is just if you can make the final product something static that a library can just sort of manage within you know our general platforms, then there's a very good chance that your libraries will be able to help you maintain some of these projects. Uh, fantastic examples, Lisa. Um, yeah, I think that it's really helpful to have this um, um, input from libraries um, in this institutional um, context. Um, I would like also to hear David, uh, because he brings like a quite, um, you know, um, unique, uh, I think, perspective from this intersection between like policymakers, as well as uh, practitioners and uh, participants, of course, so from a cultural policy point of view. So how do you conceptualize um, differently, perhaps like um, like the different communities, uh, the usefulness of failure? Yeah, I mean, the, the way we structured our research and the way the book structured is three of the chapters are from different people. So there's a chapter about the, the way in which participants perceive failure. There's a chapter about the way in which artists perceive failure. There's a chapter around about the way in which policymakers perceive failure. What we find very interesting in the cultural sector and from, from a lot of the work is that initially people are very defensive. So there was a lot of um, failure is not a helpful term. It's too absolute. What's always interesting is people never suggested that success is too absolute. People were more than delighted to use the word success about their, their projects. But failure, people really kicked back against. And we got quite a lot of that. Um, what's interesting in all of our interview data, and it very, you know, it, it was a common theme that came up, is that irrespective of how hard some 
kicked back against the idea of failure and telling us how useless it was as a term. Laterally, when they'd forgotten that they would asked them that question, they all started to talk about how other people had failed them. So the funders were a failure, they'd failed to understand, their managers were a failure, the people that employed them were failures, they would judge other artists, they would talk about the failures of their work. And actually, the reason that we find that people didn't want to talk about failures, they don't want to talk about their own failures. They're perfectly happy to point the finger at everybody else's failures. Um, and we live in a world where a blame culture is increasingly prevalent and everybody has a part to play in it because everybody is blaming everybody else for what are essentially massively complex failures within a complex system. Um, and yet, and one of the things we found that was really interesting is the people who were the most uncomfortable talking about their own failures were those that we spoke to who were the highest, had the highest level of education. So the more the level of education went up in terms of the people we spoke to, the more people were resistant about saying that they had failed. The cleverer they were at reframing everything that they did to be some form of a success. They just could not linger on the word failure. But in the creative sector, people also absolutely recognize that creativity requires risk. That if we are going to have exciting, dynamic pieces of art, pieces of culture that speak to a complex society, we need to take risks. The cultural sector is trying to deal with things like poverty, inclusion. Um, those are massively complex social problems. It's entirely disingenuous to suggest that a £10,000 project is going to fix child attainment in Scotland. Um, that isn't happening. And yet we do. And what was also very interesting amongst the sector is that once people accepted that they recognised this need for risk, and everybody we spoke to eventually said, well, of course, there's failures happening but they will not talk about them. Um, and they accept that that just leads to stuff being repeated um, and it leads to the same failures happening over and over again. And I think what was very striking in a sector that is highly evaluated is that we did a lot of work with people that was also anonymous and we allowed anonymous surveys. And we've got various things that I point to in presentations that are always, always good for the kind of presentation chat. But there's lots of statements that say, I lie on my evaluations all the time. It's bullshit. Everybody does. Everyone lies to get money. Nobody reads these evaluations. Nobody gives a damn. And I spoke to the funders and they were like, yeah, we know they're all lies. We don't believe these anyway. It's fine. Um, we don't trust the methodology. We know that they're... So we, we also found a sector where everybody knew that everyone else was lying about these failures, this massive performative activity of evaluation. And all of it was predicated upon the fact that people didn't want to be blamed. Um, there was no sense of our ability to say there absolutely was failures. And we argue there's a moral imperative that if we are claiming that work that is publicly subsidized is meant to be advancing or supporting an improvement in society for those that exert less power, then we fundamentally have to recognize those failures. I took a hell of a lot, hundreds of thousands of pounds of public sector money. And I have to be able to stand up and say, I have not advanced any level of equality for the people that I wanted to advance. Um, and that needs to be out there. And I need to be able to have that discussion and I can justify it. And then we can have a discussion about how we then change the system to work to address some of those failures. So for example, I worked with Arts Council Wales they're very proud of the fact that everything is bilingual um, and that they've got a great project where you know, the, the Welsh speakers really feel involved. And of course, the first thing I did is I said, OK, do you also do it in Hindi? And they were like, no, we don't. And I was like, great, well, you're failing them. Do you do it in Polish? No, failing them. BSL? No, failing them. And I was like, why does your website only celebrate one language that you've managed to do when you're failing everybody else? And of course, the answer is we don't have the funding. That's a perfectly legitimate answer. I'm not blaming them are failing to do it in every language but we need to be honest because then that's when technology that's when innovation happens and says we've got a problem here that the money can't allow it to happen in every language so let's solve the problem but instead we're hiding from it we're just kind of covering it over and talking about successes great points uh david uh really yeah really useful i think um just want to conclude it with um perhaps your perspective. Uh, I think you, you gave us a very good example of how different people, different communities conceptualize failure, but can you develop a bit more about like, you know, this different, for example, um, how organizations 
internally deal with this or like communities such as software engineers or IT professionals, for example? Yes, I, I, I think I can speak to a, a, a few of those, those points. Um, but let me start by underlining something that, that David said that um, he mentioned two very, very important keywords, which is uh, first is blame, the second is risk. And if we look at funding organizations or national research uh, uh, funders or uh, national research organizations, um, these are usually uh, paid from taxpayers' money. That's what they divide up and that's what they hand out to researchers. And um, it's in their interest. Uh, they, they want to be very careful uh, with that money and the least thing the last thing they want to do is to put out yearly reports saying that uh well uh thank you for the money and 99.9 percent of our projects was actually a spectacular failure but we learned a lot um so notwithstanding the fact that we are uh teaching everybody in high school already that research is sort of a you know a, a control path uh along a, a, a path of control failure towards stumbling on to, into some important realizations or insights, uh, that's simply not how our funding system is currently uh, uh, being held accountable for the money they uh, invest into science and research. Um, so um, funders, national research organizations simply hate risk. Uh, if they can, they will, uh, they will try to avoid any risk taking. Never, uh, never minding, never mind that you know. Uh, to be successful in acquiring funding, you have to uh, usually submit uh, something like a very high risk, high gain project, uh, which is sort of paradoxical from the point of view of the researcher, of course. Um, so, in my experience, there's two ways how individual researchers and research organizations or institutes can sort of um, enter in this uh, dialogue or enter in this fight with the funding organizations. Uh, the first strategy you can use is uh, simply getting too big to fail. Um, we have various European-wide infrastructural projects, science infrastructural projects, that are simply so large and that are spending so much money that nobody, really nobody inside and outside of the projects um, can, uh, can uh, uh, admit to the project being somehow a failure. Uh, they simply have to be a success to be able to account for the large amount of funding they received. So that's a very safe spot to be actually in, inside of such a project. Uh, because you can usually carve out your own kind of research and your own kind of uh, personal objectives and aims and tools that you want to provide, uh, and you're almost guaranteed that on a higher political level, uh, such a project will be a success in any case. Um, of course, in my view, in my book, that's a little bit cheating. Uh, the real fun and real uh, honest thing to do, of course, is to try to come up with a proposal uh, which is simply that good organized, that well organized, that you can always promise uh, and deliver what you promise. And this is this is the point where we uh, get to learn a lot, actually, uh, from uh, the development community, from coders and code designers, uh, because what they tend to do is they never promise one thing. They never say this is the hundred percent goal and this is the hundred percent that we will achieve. What they carefully carve out is the 10 or 20 percent of a project that they guarantee you that they will deliver. This is what we'll do no matter what, even if else all else fails. And then they sort of have a category of like, say, 50 percent uh, that they say, well, if everything goes according to plan and everything goes well, that's also what you will get. That's wonderful. And then there's the 20 uh, percent or so that's left which is, you know, blue sky scenario thinking. If everything goes well and we get double the money and we get excellent people and the sun is shining, then we'll even have all these nice to haves in the project. Uh, 
now to I, I've been reviewing quite a few research proposals also for the National Science Foundation and also in the European arena. And it strikes me that almost none of these have this kind of strategic or tactic uh, of subdividing the aims and the goals and the deliverables that they want to deliver. Uh, whereas it seems to me like a quite simple strategy to guarantee some sort of success so that in part your project will always be able to show something for it for the money that you got. Um, another thing that I think we can learn for the coding community is their uh, impressively meticulous way of working, at least if they are in a uh, decent industrial coding environment, I would say. Uh, of course, there's sloppy work all around in coding as well, uh, but coders that really understand their job, uh, for instance, always you'd use a code repository. Uh, I don't know if there are any people that have experience with repositories, but probably with data repositories in science, but also uh, coders uh, put every tiny step, every tiny little addition that they, or change that they make in their code, they put that towards their code repository, which becomes a code memory in, in uh, that instance. Um, and they all have all kinds of uh, methods and process like uh, test first development, uh, which um, makes them write a test first so that they know what the actual code should do. And only then they get to write the actual code. And these meticulously orchestrated processes guarantee that their code is actually doing what they want to do. Now, now I'm not saying that research can 100% adopt and uh, incorporate these kinds of uh, methods and processes, but there's certainly a lot uh, that we can learn from them. I think that we could try harder to kind of find the uh, the the, uh, the correspondences of the processes in research and science projects. Uh, I think we we uh, ought to be um, more interested in how they actually uh, protect to risk uh, towards risk and failure. Great advice, I think, <laughs> Jordi. Uh, thanks about this. Um, and ju I just want to kind of conclude uh, today's. Um, seminar with a very last question. Uh, I want to open also the floor for discussion. So everyone um, from the audience, if you feel that you want to also contribute, please uh, um, raise your hand or drop your uh, reply in the chat. So I would very much like to hear, you know, to try to broadening um, out our perspective. How has your work contributed uh, to normalizing uh, failure in scholarly contexts, but also in life, um, you know, more generally. I think this is a great, this is a great moment for us to, you know, reflect, you know, how work and life can work together or lessons learned from work can influence our life, <laughs> uh, perhaps all the other way around. So uh, please feel free to, um, you know, to give us your perspective. Uh, I know Lisa, you have to go. So if you want to uh, give us your thoughts. Yeah, but... sure. I'd be happy to do a bit of reflection. Um, <laughs> when I think about failure in my own career, um, I'm a systems librarian, which means that I've been uh, building library technology platforms for about 25 years now and have failed very, very often. I would say that all of that kind of work is iterative. Um, you fail a lot before you even get the code to work and then you put the code out there and then you get a lot of feedback from people and you find all the things that are wrong with it and you have to revisit it and reiterate and reiterate and reiterate and it doesn't end. So I feel like a failure is just a constant learning process in that type of environment. And because I work in a library and I don't have to worry about three to five year funding periods, I've had the luxury to be able to learn and just kind of reiterate over time um, so all of those little mini failures that happen along the way um, just become part of, of understanding our users, understanding our environment, and understanding how to build tools that are going to be uh, are going to be productive. So failure to me is just it's just part of doing business. You're always failing, right? That's how you learn. You're just always failing. Um, 
I think though that when I think about some of my biggest personal failures, like my 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 career regrets, it often has to do with um, agreeing to take something on to adopt a project or to adopt some kind of an output that I know I shouldn't because I'm getting a lot of pressure because of donors. Donors exert a lot of pressure at universities. And so making a donor happy is, some, is a reason that you might do something that you otherwise think would not be a good idea. Uh, or to make a, a sort of a superstar researcher happy and um, taking on these projects that I know really cannot be sustained is always something that is not just a failure for me, it impacts the whole organization. It really um, you know, puts the burden on my sysadmins, on my programmers. It makes everybody super grumpy when they have to try to manage something that is just sort of you know, falling apart and they don't have support and they don't know the tools and they don't, ha don't have the original research team around to help them. Um, so now for me, that's really one of the things that I'm working on is making sure that when I agree to take something into our collection forever, you know, we take that seriously. We're thinking hundreds of years out. And I think Scott mentioned that in the chat earlier. It's a really, really long time frame. Um, but I'm just trying to be really, really thoughtful about what I take on and the kind of technical debt that I'm going to leave to the next person in my position and the kind of technical debt that I have sometimes um, you know, inherited that creates a huge drag on an organization that doesn't get a ton of extra money every year, you know, so you can't afford to erode your budget by taking on all of these things that have to last forever. Um, so in general, I would say that I have been fortunate to have the kind of career that really does allow for a kind of constant failure and iteration and constant improvement, um, but also some of those failures have a very, very long-term impact on the organization and trying to avoid those kinds of things is really where I am in my career now. Great, uh, in the, thanks for this, Lisa. Um, anyone else wants to um, add their thoughts or experiences? Yeah, I mean, I can. <clears throat> yep, go yeah, ahead. It's, I think, the, 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 there's an interesting thing in some of this, you know, again, we touched upon and, and, and speaks to the difficulties of privilege. And I think that's that's the hard thing. So much of this is um, certain my ability to continue to survive individually results in me failing certain other people on a regular basis. Um, and I use this for the art sector a lot, which is if someone wants to keep their job, um, one of the easiest options around about diversifying the workforce is for them to leave um, and to and to move on um, you know and to create a space for someone who comes from another background that's off the agenda I'm not going to do that I'm not going to sacrifice my own position for somebody else and I think that there are lots of failures when you're in a position of privilege that I'm able to walk away from I'm not held accountable for um, and the, the notion of accountability a lot of people kick back quite hard against it and I think what we always have to remember is that Sometimes that sense of accountability, although it's you know sometimes not done very well, is about holding you accountable for those that are not there to hold you accountable, for whom your actions or your failures um, have used up resource and time and space that they could have had. And it's an explanation around about going, okay, I failed and I'm going to move on. And I think sometimes, and it's back to where we started, that sense of endings. I think what I'm not very good at when I've failed, although I'm, you know, I will acknowledge it, is saying, and now I'm going to give this over to you. You know, we heard somewhere else about we've often got loads of projects on the go. We like to hang on to stuff and say, well, this is mine and this is mine and this is mine. And none of it's ever finished. And it's all mine because some of it might help my career. As opposed to saying, I failed to do anything with this. And now it's over to you. It's to someone else because I'm not going to do anything with it in the next five years. And I shouldn't be hanging on to it. Um, and because the fact is, is that the, the failures that I have, and I think there's been an explosion in podcasts and discussion about failures, and my big critique of that, and I can be as guilty of this, is it is very easy for me um, in someone in a permanent job with a good salary to talk about failures from a position of essentially objective success. Other people's failures are a risk to their livelihoods and their lives, um, and they don't have the choice to walk away from them. Um, and so our privilege to walk away from our failures and sometimes without even mentioning it, is a significant one. Um, so yeah, that's that's my final reflection. 
if I could um, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Uh, build off of that um, sort of tension between privilege and failure. Uh, I talked a, li a little bit about the sort of uh, blue sky, green grass of uh, digital humanities circa 2005 to 2015, where everybody was failing publicly and blogs and Twitter and whatever, and it was all a, a joyous occasion. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I, I, I was active on social media um, uh, early in my career, and I was uh, lucky enough and privileged enough that the sort of failures that I made in public were uh, were of the sort that that helped me grow and helped my colleagues grow, and it, it made interesting collaborations happen. Um, but I don't, you know, as as the field around me has formalized, as I have uh, uh, grown in my career, uh, little mistakes I make um, uh, make larger ripples. Um, uh, right there's there's more of a um, sort of formal hi career hierarchical structure now. Um, the um, uh, the very informal social networks that that existed 2008 have calcified more into formal scholarly organizations and things of that sort. Uh, and so, you know, I'm still figuring out what the right balance is. For example, on my social media, like how how risky, how far do I go in projects that I make, how far do I go when my collaborators, um, uh, if I fail, it's fine for me, for my collaborators, it might not be fine for them or for, you know, an offhand comment that I make um, uh, in the privileged position that I'm in um, might, might truly hurt somebody else's career or prospects or what have you. Um, and I think that's, you know, both personally, it's it's my own career tra trajectory, but also with the formalization of a discipline, uh, this thing is ha this is happening as well. And I don't, um, I don't know what the what, what the the future of failure in digital humanities is because there's uh, it feels like a lot more riding on it now than there was. And m maybe that's just my own perspective, but uh, it's it's a tension that I continuously feel. Great point, Scott. Uh, I don't remember this period, to be honest. <laughs> the periods that everyone in digital humanities kind of celebrated or, you know, um, explicitly, you know, claimed that they have failed and they just, uh, yeah. Uh, but I think that it's, um, it's an interesting point to make um, because it kind of, it kind of affects discipline. So it has a disciplinary um, influence but also a personal one so um and i think this position of privilege uh also is something um useful for us to remember when we kind of assess failure or discuss even failure in every single aspect so from our work our life or let's say in other contexts yours perhaps you want to add something and just want to reiterate, so uh, everyone from the audience, um, more than um, welcome to contribute. Also, feel free to ask a question if you have a panelist. Um, we do have a good amount of uh, 10 minutes almost for questions. So please raise your hand or add your question in the chat. Your race. Yeah, while we're waiting for some questions, um, <laughs> I, I think I think I should be... Uh... Uh, very humble on on uh, the uh, the concept of privilege and failure, of course, because I'm I'm basically I'm walking privilege, of course. Uh, I'm I'm uh, in a luxury position with a steady contract in a research environment. Uh, I'm allowed to fail, as simple as that. Um, and so that that actually makes it very hard for me to to say something sensible about the future of failure in in the age. Uh, but what I would like to think is that at least I have the privilege to be open and frank about my failures. And I hope that this uh, being open up about my failures, I hope that this um, will show to, to younger or less privileged uh, researchers that, you know, failing at least is okay. It might not be okay in your position to uh, to talk openly about it yet. Uh, but at least I can show that, you know, failing is part of the job. Um, so that that's what I would like to do, at least uh, from my perspective. 
And uh, uh, answering uh, to Scott, I, I think failure has a great future in DH. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of room for failure still. If I, maybe I could pick up on that um, to ask David another question. One of the outputs of some of your research was the set of recommendations for people who are evaluating projects and how those evaluations could be more useful in part by acknowledging the failures. I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what some of those recommendations might be, and we could maybe see how they might be um, useful for digital humanities as we evaluate our projects. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it touched upon this before that a big component of that is of having the discussion before you start, because two years, three years, four years down the line, we can all make something look like a success and we forget about the things that we wanted to avoid. Um, and so, for example, I'm doing a big piece of evaluation at the moment for the Scottish government, um, a very large piece of funding that was across the country about supporting communities and artists through COVID. Um, and as part of that, at the beginning, I spoke to the different people that were involved and I used the framework and said, what would failure look like for you? What would it feel like? How would you know that it happened? And, and I used the different gradients. And so people were able to do that in advance and they would say, for example, some of the things we got was, well, it would look like people taking my stories and using them to advance their own careers. That was a marker of failure. It would look like I would go to an event and there wouldn't be any food with someone else's marker of failure um, for the communities they were working with. Artists um, said I would be using some of the money that I meant to be paying myself to buy materials and equipment. So those were all things at the beginning that people said, this is what failure would look like and feel like. And we talked about what success would look like and we're now using that as the tool because that was our past self writing down and committing to saying this is what failure would look like so that our future self can't with the best of intentions be a bit slippery around about ignoring some of those components and I think the other element with it is this is not about you know we said in evaluation it's not about bashing people but it's about getting comfortable about talking about success and failure together and our argument is that it makes it more credible Part of the difficulty with a lot of evaluation just now is it just simply isn't credible. Um, if we gave someone £100,000, as I said, we don't believe that they have addressed, you know, inbuilt racism within a particular community. But they may have progressed it a little bit, but they would have had failures as well. Um, and so actually talking about success and failure side by side in an evaluation, our position is it makes it more credible. It makes the, the successes that you have had feel more authentic and it's a little bit and I'm you know I'll be honest we've taken some from standard academic practice about talking about the limitations of your work so much of academia was predicated upon transparency transparency of methodology transparency of limitations transparency of who's involved and the same thing is here be transparent about where you have failed and I think you know George was saying it's it's where you have the safety, because some people are not safe, to be honest about your failure. If we can't get those people doing it, then we can't expect those that are in more precarious situations to start doing it. Um, and so, yeah, so, so for us, it's really around about being transparent about those failures alongside successes. I think connecting that to the sort of acknowledging the limitations of method, which is sort of a, a fundamental academic approach, even if we're not necessarily as good that in the humanities as we might like to be. Um, I think that's a really nice way of connecting that, that work to the other digital humanities work we've talked about today. And uh, what David's just said, but also it, it was also um, mentioned in, um, in other um, panelists' points. So it was that, you know, failure, um, it's also connected to a number of values that we don't often um you know conceptualize as said so you know failure you know can be linked to you know the value of transparency of honesty of respect of you know um this um this inclusivity um aspect so i think that this is something important to remember uh, perhaps and you know speaking as a as a younger scholar without a so privileged position so uh, I think that is really useful and really important 
for all of us um, in the community of the digital humanities to have this type of examples that yours just mentioned, you know, um, mentors or even, you know, um, examples of people that they, if they are not celebrating, they are at least, you know, acknowledging their failures as something that is normal and it's part of, you know, um, both the academic and the scholarly life, but also, you know, of life that happens. I think this is something that, you know, we should keep in mind and, you know, um, everyone from our own position, you know, it. Um, I think, you know, we should really uh, take it into account when we, um, you know, in our everyday practice, in our everyday scholarly work, but also in our everyday relationships, um, in the communities that we are joining, in the relationships uh, that we're making. Um, I think this is something for us to remember. Um, I think the, the question in the chat is a really pertinent one, and I would say that the... Yeah. Go ahead, so should failure be included as a possibility in any methodology framework for a research project? And I think this is, again, about the, you know, methodologies up front. What does this look like? And I think we find this quite a lot in the arts. So one of the big things is participation was people really panicked about saying, I put in a funding application. I said I was going to do this, but it was community participative work. And when I talked to the community, they wanted to do something else. So I'm faced with two choices. I either don't do what I told my funder I was going to do, or I ignore the community and just do what I promised I would do. And they felt trapped in this situation. And so again, it's this sense of marking out what is a failure. And in that contact, in that context, not responding to the community is a failure of participation. And where we took some of that from was methodological work and interpretative analysis, particularly Devorah Yanow's work in interpretative policy analysis. And she talks about the fact that in the types of work that she does, um, changing the research if she talks about the fact that if my research question hasn't changed after i've been immersed in the field my methodology has been a failure because the very premise of my methodology is that it should be responsive to the communities that i'm working with um, and so if there has been no change it is probably indicative that my methodology has failed to do what it looked like and so again in a discussion of methodology is to say, what would it look like if this methodology fails to deliver the things that I'm assuming or fails to um, you know, produce the epistemological understanding that I'm seeking? Um, and so including that as part of the discussion is a way of talking about, again, for me, the, the credibility of methodologies. Yeah, great point, David. Thanks for um, answering this. Um, is there any other question point that, um, okay, Kasper, if we're honest about, so I think that with uh, this point question, we're going to conclude. So if we're honest about failure in research, what about luck? Often things don't go as planned, but still turn out well. But we had luck behind success intelligence. I think that's a great point. <laughs> um, um, anyone want to briefly comment on this? Scott? Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, yeah, you know, I my my background is in history of science, and so I perhaps think of this from from more of that perspective than than from my own career, uh, looking at the you know the the history of uh, um, folks who've been doing this for the last seven hundred years, uh, and the the um, uh, the role of of luck in the work that we do, and in, in those, uh, uh, as they say, eureka moments, um, it, that that we can retroactively say, oh, that was my plan all along, um, where you get uh, these um, uh, uh, post hoc um, uh, uh, narratives about um, everything working out. Um, I think, um, who was it? Uh, Matt Lincoln um, has talked about uh, confabulation in the humanities, and I believe it was Lincoln Mullen um, who used to go around saying, uh, I think it was Lincoln Mullen, I may be misremembering this, it could have been Cameron Blevins, who would go around with a chart uh, that he had produced of some historical trend, right? Uh, 
printers increasing in international diversity over time, or so I, I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, and he would tell the story um, and then look to see, you know, all of the people in the audience who were nodding along. Uh, and then the next slide, he would actually turn the uh, chart upside down and say, no, this is actually what, what the data really showed. Um, but, you know, you all just sort of went along with this, assuming this is what the data showed. So this narrative must be correct. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that uh, th these examples really show how, um, how much our preconceived assumptions um, structure the conclusions that we draw um, and how we're really able to come up with an interesting and uh, uh, correct sounding narrative on any data that we see. Um, and, you know, it's worth zooming out from that and thinking, oh my gosh, how many of these uh, narratives am I constructing on, on data that's not actually good, right? There are a lot of failures that, you know, uh, they were a failure, and, and if you look at it one way, were a failure, are a failure, but nobody's caught it yet, and so it's fine. Um, and uh, yeah, so so to uh, Casper's point, I think having that honesty and that humility uh, is is essential because uh, you know, in retrospect, a hundred years from now, everybody's going to look back on everything we did and say, well, that was all wrong. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we need to approach these things with, with, with that humility in mind. And I think, you know, for me, again, it's what is luck. The, the working psychology would suggest that, you know, luck is, is a, is a way in which we understand, um, certain, uh, interactions that happen. And I think I would go back to, you know, from a kind of more sociological perspective to say that our luck very much relates to the context and back to questions about privilege. Um, so, you know, I am lucky um, and something happened because I was able to be in that space where actually, even if I hadn't planned something, there was other people there or my education that I'd been able to gain because of where I live means that I've got the language and the social skills in order to wing my way through it. Um, and that might be lucky, um, but fundamentally that that is to do with the the resources that I've got access to um, and my ability to, to manage that space. And so I think I think any understanding of luck is an interesting confluence of sociological benefits and also our psychological response to how we understand the 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 interaction of those um, social objects. Yes, um, great point. Thanks for this. David. And on that note, I think to I think it's time for us to kind of wrap up and conclude. Uh, many thanks to our panelists um, and to everyone who joined us today for this uh, last uh, seminar of the Reframing uh, Failure series. We hope this series helped um, helped us to kind of approach failure in interesting new ways. Um, stay tuned uh, because we are planning various initiatives around this topic. Uh, and uh, many, many thanks again, uh, also Michael for co-hosting um, and uh, helping uh, organizing the series. And yeah, thanks all for this. <laughs>